Hello, and welcome back to Felony Spectator. I am your host, Heather. Last week, we did part one of the poisoning of Mary Yoder. We left off with the police receiving an anonymous letter blaming Adam for poisoning his mother. Police also found the poison, colchicine, in his Jeep as per the letter. But now the police had to figure out who wrote this letter as Adam claimed he was being framed. Investigators would speak to Katie again. She was still a potential witness at this point, but police needed to figure out where this letter came from. The forensic lab informed police that DNA taken from under the stamp on the anonymous letter showed to be female DNA. It was then thought that these letters also came from the chiropractic clinic. So investigators would ask Katie if she'd volunteer her DNA so they could rule her out. Katie agrees and comes down to the station. But oddly, she comes prepared with letterhead from the office and an envelope to prove that part of her job was to pre-stamp the envelopes. Officers thought this seemed a bit strange that she brought envelopes with her without being asked. Side note, there was also female trace DNA on the package of colchicine found in Adam's Jeep. This would later be explained away by Katie saying that she signed for a package when it was delivered to the clinic and she put the box on the counter in the back. Meanwhile, Adam was being questioned further in regards to the receipt found in his Jeep that had an email address linked to him. Mr. Adam Yoder, 1999 at gmail.com. Adam says that it isn't his email and he has no idea where it came from. He provided two other email addresses that he primarily used, and this wasn't one of them. He also gave passwords to his email addresses, but didn't know the password to this one. So Katie would be brought in once again because a few things needed to be clarified. The police started to realize that Katie was really the only person who could have wrote the letter. If so, maybe she'd have more information for them. When they asked Katie if she wrote the letter, she finally admitted that yes, it was her who wrote the letter. She did it though because she was afraid of Adam. He started acting differently after she found out he killed Mary and she didn't know if maybe she'd be next. She denied putting anything in Adam's Jeep and just wanted to let the secret out. Investigators asked her why Adam would keep the murder weapon as most people dispose of the murder weapon. She said she thought he might use it for someone else. She then goes on to say, right, but guys don't use poison with a smirk. When the detective responds with a lot of them do, she says, they say it's a lady's weapon. Officers were quite surprised by this comment. But now that Katie admitted to writing the letter, they had to try and piece together what was happening. Katie and Adam's past would be looked into deeper. When Adam and Katie first started dating, she told him of a story about how she was essayed in high school. A past boyfriend pushed her down and forced her to do things. He then forced her to have family dinner right afterwards. Now, this was alarming for Adam, but the story brought them close together because Adam promised to always protect her. He was also proud of her for sharing this secret. But then Katie also made essay allegations against Adam not long before Mary was sick. She claimed that one night he got extremely intoxicated, physically hurt her, threatened to kill her, and then forced her to do things. Now, Adam felt horrible when she told him this, but the odd thing about this claim was that she didn't bring it up for months after the alleged incident. Now, during these months that she had kept it to herself, she never acted or seemed different. In fact, Adam remembered that the following morning in question, after they woke up, Katie had gone to buy Adam a new inhaler because he lost his. Adam was really hungover, so Katie also picked up breakfast on the way back. They had intercourse twice that day, and she didn't seem scared or distracted. He also didn't notice any injuries on her either. He thought they had a really nice, relaxing day together. Adam had no idea that he blacked out and forced her to do things until after the breakup when she started dating someone else. She had sent him a random cryptic text message. This message came on October 19th, three months after the drunken incident and after they had broken up. Then she waited until November to send Adam photos of the injuries she incurred during the assault. 
Now, none of the photos really matched with what she had claimed to have happened. Adam then realized that she must have downloaded photos from the internet and pretended that they were her. Now, Katie was dating someone new, and it was her new boyfriend who encouraged her to report the incident to the police. Now, remember, this happened when she met Adam. She told Adam a story of a high school boyfriend. So it seems like she shares a traumatic incident with a new boyfriend to form a bond. Now, strangely, when she went to the police, somehow she didn't have these photos of her injuries anymore, and the details were really fuzzy. Also around the same time, Adam found something interesting on his computer. Katie's iPhone had been entirely backed up onto his computer accidentally. She had plugged it into his computer to listen to a podcast and inadvertently backed up her phone. Now, while looking through his computer, Adam was able to confirm that Katie had also cheated on him. She had slept with one of his good friends, someone that he spent a lot of time with. Now, I guess Adam suspected this before and it was something they fought about, but Katie always denied it and said it was all in his head. It turned out that she was meeting this guy at hotels and had saved his information in her phone as Jen. There was also saved text messages in her notes app that appeared to be drafts of messages she sent him during arguments. When Adam brought up the fact that he had reason to believe that she was lying about the assault, she suddenly dropped the charges. He also saw other things on the phone too, which we will definitely get into. But this was a glimpse into their relationship. Adam couldn't shake Katie, and every time he thought he did, Katie would manipulate herself back into his life with text messages, gaslighting him, and convincing him that they loved each other. Another time when Adam tried to move on and had a new girlfriend, Katie called him in the middle of the night one night when he was sleeping at his new girlfriend's home. Now, Katie typically text messaged him, so seeing a missed call from her in the night was a little surprising. He tried to call her back, but with no answer. Later the following morning, she sent a text saying that she was in the hospital. She was apparently pregnant with his baby, but had lost the child. Adam suggested that they meet up and talk about it in person. She then said that she didn't lose the baby naturally, but she had to make the decision to terminate and blamed Adam for that decision because she thought he never wanted kids which wasn't true. And this created another series of arguments and anger. Adam said if she had called him more than once, he would have come to the hospital and they could have made that decision together. She then changed her story to say that it was an emergency eptopic pregnancy and it had to be done. But she was very sad that she lost their baby and now knowing he wanted kids changed things. So Adam would break up with his new girlfriend to be with Katie once again. Something else that's interesting was that Adam had also experienced very similar symptoms to what Mary had experienced three months prior to Mary getting sick. Katie had been texting Adam and telling him about this pill that could help him with his memory and focus for school. On April 14th, she asked to meet up for lunch and kept on about these pills. So Adam finally said, sure, he would try them. They were called alpha brain supplements. Adam took one and nothing happened. Strangely, she continued to text message him about these pills, asking if he took them. Did he like them? Then other texts baiting him saying, you're ignoring me, I'm just trying to help you. Adam eventually took another pill on April 22nd after Katie asked him again if he had taken them. This time, within an hour, he got very sick. And the symptoms were very similar to what his mother went through with severe stomach pains, throwing up, diarrhea, weakness, back pain, and joint pains. His dad had rushed him to the hospital for fluids, but it was assumed that it was a stomach bug. Adam went home, but his dad would remember how awful it was seeing Adam in so much pain. It took Adam over an entire month to start feeling like himself again, and he missed his finals completely. He never took the supplements again, but he will never forget that she was very fixated on him taking the pills and then fixated on his sickness and what doctors were doing to help. Now, when Katie went from being a witness to a suspect in Mary's death, police took her phone and she had all these weird things hiding in her notes app. And Adam had seen these too. She often typed out long text messages and saved them for when she needed them. For example, one was from April when she had started texting Adam about the alpha brain pills. The note was titled, Optimal for Finals, all about that A plus life. In the note was drafts of the text messages asking if he liked it. 
It also said that he needs to take it consecutively to get better results. The more you take, the better it works. It mentioned that if Adam complained about the pills, her suggestion would be to take it earlier in the day. And she had many of these made up conversations in her notes app. And the notes app would be something brought up in the trial because people generally don't write drafts and save them. People usually send text messages live in conversation, meaning you type as you're thinking about what you're gonna say. There were old notes that she deleted like, Adam has given out his password and Dr. Bill wants to retire. She also asked herself, could it be grainy like Truvia? If yes, office, with no other context. Another entry included discover EN 4055-1990 at G, Adam is gay. What is interesting about that note is that the password to the email used to order the poison was Adam is gay. Another note said, love could have saved her. Mary would have lived forever. And I cannot believe she's gone. Then dated July 20th, 2015, she wrote, yesterday was so sudden and unexpected. Now, Mary went to work in the morning on July 20th and wasn't admitted to the hospital until the evening. So what was Katie saying yesterday for? What was sudden and unexpected the day before Mary passed away? There was also a note with excerpts from the anonymous letter. Katie claimed she'd never heard of Colchicine, but in her app, she wrote, A-Y-K, his mother. He put something called Colchicine, spelt incorrectly, in one of her vitamins. There was also deleted screenshots, including a chart with Mary and Bill's personal info, SIN numbers, and birthdays. Web searches of why is thallium the poison of choice and searches of other toxic chemicals. Also on her cell phone was a deleted app called CamScanner. I believe CamScanner is an app where you create PDFs. And a document on the deleted CamScanner app would show a letter of intent for Cairo Family Care letterhead. Now, colchicine is easy enough for any doctor to get, but the company that sold the colchicine needed to have a letter of intent to order such a toxic medication. This letter of intent was sent from the email mradamyoder1999 at gmail.com. The main computer in the chiropractic office at the front where Katie primarily worked would be the computer that had evidence of the letter of intent that was sent from Mr. Adam Yoder 1999 at gmail.com. The email address that Adam didn't recognize. On September 15th, somebody sitting at Katie's desk around noon when the office was closed for lunch would create that email account, Mr. Adam Yoder, 1999 at gmail.com. Now, Adam claims he was not in the area at this time. However, a friend of Adam's would later testify that Adam would sometimes swing by the office to take supplements and had on occasion used that computer. Now, the most incriminating evidence, I think, is that this email address was accessed at work and one of the IP addresses that accessed this email address was Katie's home address, and she also logged into it with her phone while at her mother's house. Now, it's said that Adam's really, really good with computers, but could he change her IP address to show that she was using that email at her mother's house? I don't know, I don't know enough about computers. But that email address was the only email address used to contact the company Art Chemicals where the colchicine was ordered. An employee who worked at Art Chemicals, Rosa, said that they received a phone call inquiring about the order, and the person who called was a young female with a very soft voice. This medication was also paid for with prepaid MasterCard credit cards, not business credit cards. Rosa from Art Chemicals saw a discrepancy in the price of the colchicine. The price was a little bit higher, so she had to call the phone number provided to her, but nobody answered. She then looked up Cairo Family Care and Chiropractic Family Care came up on Google. The names are similar, but the addresses were the same. So she called the number from Google and a female answered. This female was presumably the receptionist and again, the person with the soft voice. Rosa explained the cost discrepancy and that same person said no problem and completely understood 
understood what order Rosa was referring to. Later that same day, an email came in from the Mr. Adam Yoder 1999 at gmail.com account explaining that they needed to buy another prepaid card to cover the cost difference. Rosa replied that she also needed a letter of intent and their business license number since Colchicine is lethal and they need to know what it would be used for. Two days later, a letterhead came from Cairo Family Care with the company logo of Chiropractic Family Care on it. This letter had Adam's signature on it as accounts receivable manager, the Gmail email address, as well as Mary's signature dated January 14th, 2014. The letter explained that the colchicine was going to be used for polyploidism in plants. They weren't going to use it on humans or animals. Now, I don't really know what polyploidism is, but I believe it has something to do with the chromosome in plants. Why would a chiropractic clinic need that? I don't really know. What's interesting is that Katie had actually admitted to police that she purchased prepaid MasterCard, but she claims that she didn't use them. She would also be seen purchasing said cards on CTV footage. Art Chemicals also needed a W-9 tax form, which was required for the purchase as well. And this form was typed on a typewriter on January 14th when Katie was working. Police found the imprint of this letter in the ink from the typewriter from the office. Katie would be charged with the murder of Mary Yoder. And the trial was interesting. Now, one of the patients at the clinic testified that Adam occasionally filled in for Katie if she was either sick, on vacation, or needed time off for school. Adam allegedly had covered a large chunk of time at the very end of 2014 into the beginning of 2015. The defense tried to say it could have been him that created the email account at the office. However, a payroll logbook wasn't brought forward to show who was working during the time the culture scene was ordered. Katie would argue that it couldn't have been her because she wouldn't have had time to put this dangerous medication into a vitamin. Yes, she had access to Mary's things while at work, but when would she have time to put on a mask, gloves, and goggles, spike something of Mary's, and then go back to work unnoticed? Now, logically, she could have done that at home and brought the pill to work, but she didn't think that was an option either. Mary's protein powder and almond milk came back negative for colchicine, so it is also assumed that it was a vitamin as per the anonymous letter. But investigators still didn't know what exactly was poisoned. Now, remember, the lethal dose is so small that anything really could have been poisoned. It wouldn't have taken much at all to make Mary sick. Mary did take vitamins and supplements daily, and lots of people who take supplements also take them two to three times a day. But we don't know if she had a pill organizer that she took back and forth from home to work, or if she had a second set at the office. Now, on the day that Mary fell ill, she had left for lunch to see her mother. She prepared lunch for her mother, but she didn't eat with her as she was in a rush to get back to the office. So would her pill container be left at the office while she was with her mother? Did she take vitamins upon her return to the office? Nobody really knows. Prosecution's theory was that Katie didn't want to kill Adam because she wanted to keep him as someone in her life that she could control. Every time they broke up, Katie had some strategy on reeling Adam back in. She also recently had been messaging him about the money that he owed her but it was getting increasingly more and more difficult to get his attention. He stopped caring about the money, he stopped caring about making her happy, and stopped caring about remaining friends. So Katie either wanted revenge, or maybe she thought Adam would get an inheritance and then she'd get her money back. Another theory is that she wanted Adam to be hurt so badly that he would call her and need her again for comfort which Adam did. He called Katie from the hospital and she came to comfort him. The defense, on the other hand, pointed the finger at Bill during the first trial. There was actually two trials. The first one, they claimed Bill was the only person with a motive. They thought Bill poisoned Mary's daily protein shake before work, and that is why he wasn't in the office all day. He was avoiding seeing Mary suffer. Side note, she didn't actually have a shake that morning. Medical records indicate that Mary informed her doctors that she had a protein bar for lunch and nothing for breakfast. The defense also brought up the so-called affair with Kathy, Mary's sister, as well as something called superweed. 
Apparently, Mary and Bill came up with some sort of mixture in the 80s that enhanced the growth of a certain illegal plant. Now, remember the letter of intent said polyploidism. Now, I tried to understand what that means, and it seems kind of complicated. But in a nutshell, colchicine improves the plant's breeding. Now, I guess this is important when growing illegal plants because you want more female plants. Anyway, the defense claim it was Mary who probably ordered the toxin for Bill, and it was actually her who spoke with Rosa from Art Chemicals. However, Mary was probably unaware that Bill was actually going to kill her with it, and it was not for use for the plants. And that is quite the theory. The defense also claimed that Bill got a $400,000 inheritance from his father's death. And Bill thought that this wasn't going to be enough for two people to retire on. So I guess they thought that he needed to get rid of Mary and keep the money all to himself. They also claim that Mary must have gotten a second dose of poison while at the hospital, which has never been proven either. After the first trial, the jury was deadlocked. So the judge declared a mistrial. Now the prosecution, they didn't let it go. And a second trial happened on November 6th of 2017. Now, between trial one and trial two, Katie was out on bail, but she broke her bail conditions by going to restaurants nine different times. Now, yes, Katie wasn't out drinking or partying, but breaking these bail conditions is still breaking the law. She just didn't care and wasn't taking things very seriously. For the second trial, the defense completely changed up their strategy. Instead of pointing at Bill, the person they originally thought had motive, they pointed the finger at Adam. This time, they claimed that he was troubled and that there was a falling out between Mary and Adam. They felt that Adam wanted revenge on Katie and killed his mother simply to frame her. That's another interesting theory. I don't know why anyone would kill their own mother to frame somebody else, but that's where they were going during the second trial. After the second trial, there was almost a second hung jury. But after the judge insisted the jury keep trying, they did find her not guilty of second degree murder, but guilty of manslaughter. During sentencing, Adam would speak out saying, quote, I hate the defendant with every bone in my body and every drop of blood in my veins, end quote. Leanna and Tamron, Adam's sisters, also requested a maximum sentence. Katie would be given 23 years as well as five years of post-release supervision, but she has held on to the fact that she is innocent. This may seem surprising, but Mary's sister Janine, Sally, and Sharon have all spoken out and are all on Katie's side saying that Bill and Adam probably did this together. They've created a website www.freekatieconnolly.com that I think the sisters opened up to show the world why they believe Katie was wrongly convicted. It's a very nice website with very innocent pictures of Katie looking happy and smiling. On the website, there's also links to other YouTubers who agree that she's innocent and news articles featuring the possibility that Katie was framed. They have lots of theories and speculation as to why they think this happened. On the website, it mainly points to Bill. He had an affair with their older sister, Kathy, and they strongly believe that the affair happened before Mary passed. They also allege that Adam and his mother were indeed fighting. Mary was said to have been an enabler, according to the sisters, but she had started to become firmer with him, not giving him money, which made him angry. Also, according to the website, it says that Katie did not write the anonymous letter. Allegedly, she was the victim of coercive interrogations. The claims were that after hours of being badgered by the sheriffs, she vomited in distress and caved. Now, I've seen the videos of the interrogations, and they don't really seem that intense. I also think Katie told the sheriffs that she wrote the letter after only 30 minutes of an interview, but I could be wrong about that. Now, according to the sheriff, they believe that Katie only appeared to become nauseous after admitting she wrote the letter. Mary's sisters all think that Bill wrote the anonymous letter, and it's believed Bill poisoned one of Mary's vitamin capsules that she took every single morning. They also think that Bill poisoned her a second time at the hospital with either the lozenges or the inhaler. There's also a section of the website that suggests there was a pot operation that Bill and Adam might have been in together. The culture scene that was used was actually agricultural grade, and they also believe that it was going to be used for their plants. Adam once had mentioned to Katie that he'd pay her back 
in the spring. And she took that as when the harvest was done and sold. So was the colchicine bought for the plants or was it bought for murder? It's kind of unclear with that theory. My thoughts, if you read Katie's website, you might agree that it is very compelling. If the goal was to plant a seed of doubt, they've done a pretty good job. And I can see why there was a hung jury in the first trial and almost a hung jury in the second trial. However, is what they're saying reasonable doubt? Now, I can't say that it is. For me, I don't think so. One thing that bothered me is that Katie's now denying writing the anonymous letter. Now, let's say it was Adam who killed his mother. Based on the details of the letter, it seems very obvious that it was her who wrote it. But now she's denying that. If Adam was trying to frame Katie, he wouldn't have left the poison in his car and write a letter blaming himself. That just doesn't make sense. If Bill killed Mary as per the first trial... Then who wrote the letter? Bill could have to point the finger to Adam. Maybe he hid the poison in the Jeep. But I have a hard time believing that a man close to retirement would go out of his way to kill his wife and then purposely throw his son under the bus. I feel like if he killed his wife, he would do it secretly and move on with his life. I also have a hard time believing that he had the computer knowledge to put things on Katie's phone like in her notes app and the can scanner app that was found deleted. Her IP address was also used several times, including at her mother's home. Now I know it's easy enough to change IP addresses, but I don't know if you can make it look like they're being used at locations where they're not. I just don't even know if that's possible. In my mind, it makes sense that Katie did it. I think she's manipulative and narcissistic and will continue to point the finger at either Adam or Bill. I don't think she was computer savvy enough to realize that she was leaving all these clues and breadcrumbs on her devices. She's lucky she wasn't charged with first degree murder because it seems very premeditated and deliberate. I'll put the link to Katie's website in the comments so you can read it yourself and tell me what you think. Has Katie been wrongly convicted? Should the police look further into Bill or Adam? Or is the right person behind bars? Mary's own sisters believe Katie, so is Katie just that good at lying or is she innocent? Please let me know what you think. I know this was a long one. I hope you were able to watch both videos so you can really understand what happened here. Thanks again for joining me here at Felony Spectator. We will see you again soon.